If you've been following the news, you couldn't have possibly missed the big story from Taiwan. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited the island. China responded with military drills. It fired ballistic missiles towards Taiwan and repeatedly rehearsed the assault of Taiwan. When the world protested, China turned around and said, this is Beijing's internal matter. But is it? What explains China's obsession with Taiwan? We'll discuss on this episode of Gravitas Plus. Hello, I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay, and this is Taiwan. It is an island in the South China Sea. It is around 36,000 square kilometers. Taiwan is roughly 161 kilometers from mainland China. The two are separated by the Taiwan Strait. Zoom out and you will see the Philippines, South Korea, Brunei, Vietnam and Japan, all of them a stone's throw away from Taiwan. So why is it only China that is obsessed with this little island? Taiwan first appeared in Chinese records during the Zhou Dynasty. The emperor had sent an expedition and the explorer spotted Taiwan. This is China's side of the story. In the 1600s, Taiwan became a Dutch colony. Portuguese sailors called Taiwan Ila Formosa, meaning beautiful island. The Dutch rule lasted from 1624 to 1661. In 1683, Taiwan came under China. This was during the Qing dynasty. In the years that followed, a lot of Chinese migrated to Taiwan. They were mostly Hakka Chinese. This Chinese rule lasted till 1895 because in 1895, China lost the first Sino-Japanese war. Taiwan had to be given away to Japan. Decades later, when Japan lost the Second World War, Taiwan was up for grabs again and China was on the winning side. Then it was called the Republic of China or ROC. So the ROC jumped at the idea of controlling Taiwan. It had the blessings of the US and Britain. But the Republic of China or ROC was a mess. It was a military dictatorship. Chiang Kai-shek was its leader. He led a nationalist party called the Kuomintang. He ruled China with an iron fist. Under him, there was unrest, unhappiness and a civil war. It was at this time that communist leader Mao Zedong became increasingly popular. His Red Army fought Chiang's party, Mao won. In 1949, he established the People's Republic of China or the PRC. Chiang fled to Taiwan. The island had a subtropical climate, abundant resources, and advanced infrastructure built by the Japanese. Also, Taiwan was free of communist influence. And Chiang did not move to Taiwan alone. Along with him moved one and a half million people. The ROC's Air Force, artifacts from the National Palace Museum, the National Central Library, the National Central Museum, the Beijing Library, fuel and ammunition, radio stations, boats, clothes, cars, wood, some 774 boxes of gold. Basically, Chiang took all that he could take from China. He established a government in exile in Taiwan and then he declared martial law. By the 1950s, there were two Chinas. Chiang's military dictatorship in Taiwan, called the ROC or the Republic of China, and Mao's communist China, called the PRC or the People's Republic of China. ROC, PRC. Both claimed to be the real China. A battle for international recognition and legitimacy followed. Taiwan held the ROC's seat at the United Nations. Western countries recognized Taiwan as the only China. In 1954, the first Taiwan Strait crisis broke out. Here's what happened. Chiang put thousands of troops on two Taiwanese islands, Kinmen and Matsu. Mao's China responded by bombing these islands. Four years later, another crisis broke out. Mao's men again bombed Kinmen and Matsu. They wanted to dislodge the ROC troops, Chiang's troops. Amid this military tension, Taiwan's economy grew. Between 1960 and 1980, Taiwan saw an economic boom. Workers were exploited. There was military rule. Exports grew. This was the era of made in Taiwan. But soon Taiwan's luck ran out. You see, the Cold War was bubbling and Mao's China became strategically important to the US. And with American priorities, it seemed like the world's priorities had changed too. In 1971, the United Nations chose to recognize Beijing as the real China. They dumped Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek died in 1975. One year later, Mao Zedong died too. Deng Xiaoping became the leader of China. He began opening China to the world. Over the next 10 years, relations improved between China and Taiwan. People were allowed to visit families on either side. Trade across the strait also improved. But as economic ties deepened, so did cultural divisions. They became worse. People in Taiwan began identifying as Taiwanese, not Chinese. A meeting was held in Hong Kong in 1992. The two sides, Beijing and Taipei, agreed on one China. 
But the problem is, it was a verbal consensus and its interpretation varied. First, let me tell you the Chinese Communist Party's version. One China means the two sides of the strait belong to one China and this China is ruled by Beijing and they'll work together to seek national reunification. This is Beijing's view. But Taiwan understood it differently. Also remember, while China is ruled by the Communist Party, Taiwan is an actual democracy with multiple parties. So in the year 2000, Taiwan elected Chen Sui Ban as its president. Now he was from the Democratic People's Party and this party openly backed Taiwanese independence. China was not prepared for this surprise. So Beijing passed a new law, the anti-secession law. It basically said that China could use force to keep Taiwan. In 2014, tens of thousands of students gathered in front of the Taiwanese parliament. They began protesting the ratification of a trade agreement with China. The students cried, we demand transparency because Taiwan is a democracy. This was the start of what's called the Sunflower Movement. And this was the first open protest against China. It was a new dawn for Taiwan. But China held on to its reunification demand. In 2013, Xi Jinping became president. He revealed his China dream. He wanted to revive China's historical glory. Xi's pitch for Taiwan hinges on the idea of one country, two systems. Taiwan does not really buy China's promises. It wants to remain a democracy. And Tsai Ing-wen's election is proof. She campaigned on the idea of transparency. She's from the Democratic Progressive Party. She's critical of China. She was elected president in 2016 and re-elected in 2020 with a record 8.2 million votes. Today, Taiwan is a self-ruled island. It has its own flag, its own anthem, its own currency, its own institutions. Taiwan's per capita GDP is more than $33,000. It is a chip superpower, the world's chip factory. But Taiwan's legal status is still unclear. Only 14 countries recognize Taiwan. China sees Taiwan as a renegade province, a breakaway province. Xi Jinping says Taiwan must be and will be reunited with China. You could say the whole purpose of his regime is what he calls the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, the unification of Taiwan. And Xi wants this done by 2049. Because that is when the People's Republic of China will celebrate its 100th anniversary, 2049, and she wants to do what Mao could not, what neither Deng Xiaoping nor Hu Jintao could do. He wants to be China's greatest leader, and for that, he must take Taiwan. Under Xi Jinping, China has forced countries to shun Taiwan, to stick to the One China policy, to set up embassies in China, not in Taiwan. Companies have been asked to list Taiwan as a part of China on their websites. What is China's basis for claiming Taiwan? One, history. Two, the 1992 consensus. But there's no real consensus on what the 1992 consensus really was. Also, should Taiwan's future be a victim of its past? Taiwan has moved on. Today, it is a dynamic and pluralistic society. It boasts of the world's first transgender cabinet minister, the first country in the region to legalize same-sex marriage. In 2021, Taiwan was ranked the world's eighth most democratic country. 62% of the island's residents regard themselves as exclusively Taiwanese. Only 3% consider themselves Chinese. In 1994, that number was 26%. Today, Taiwan has its own sense of identity, one that could not be more different from authoritarian China. Xi Jinping does not agree. He says independence will only bring hardship. But what about the Taiwanese people? What do they want? 5.2% want independence as soon as possible. Only 1.3% are in favor of reunification. What about the rest of them? They want to maintain status quo. But look at China's military moves. Status quo is evidently not an option anymore.